Welcome to Macroeconomics 3. So in this uh, module, we're going to cover four different units. So these units will entail of a total of uh, eight chapters. So unit one, we're basically going to look at chapter 10 to 13, which is basically looking at the macro economy in the long run or simply the economy in the long run and in chapter 14 to 15 which is basically unit 2 of our module we'll be looking at expectations that is the role of expectation in output fluctuations then unit 3 in case of chapter 18 which is basically looking at the at the open economy so we'll look at the openness in the goods and financial market. Then the last part, which is unit four, will cover chapter 25. Chapter 25 looks at the, evolu the evolution of macroeconomic thought, which basically looks at the different models and theories that are there in uh, macroeconomics and how have they evolved over time. The perception we have on how the economy is doing are often dominated by year-to-year -year fluctuations in the economic activity. So this is the reason why, if you may remember in the past, when we look at the economic activity, we basically look at the business cycle, where we see that the recession leads to gloom and uh, an expansion to optimism. But if we would rather take a step back to get a look at the activity over a longer period of time. The picture that we often see changes. Flu the, the, the ideal fluctuations fade and growth, which is the steady increase in aggregate output over time, dominates that picture. So in this chapter, which is chapter 10, we look at the determinants of output in the long run, where growth is dominated instead of uh, of fluctuations or rather where growth we see a picture of growth dominating instead of fluctuations so our goal in this chapter is to understand what determines growth why some countries are growing where others are, are basically not and why other countries are richer than others or rather why other countries are poor are rich and others are poor so these kind of uh, goals or questions basically answer the reason why as economists we are so interested about measuring economic growth. So generally as economists we seek to measure the improvement in the standard of living and it is represented by economic output per person or output per capita. So instead of saying our interest is, more, is mostly on just measuring output. The key factor that we basically are interested in is um, measuring the improvement in the standard of living. And that measure is measured using a output per person or output per capita variable. So as I've said, to measure the standard of living, we use the output per capita variable. So this variable can be observed across time and across countries. So across time, we basically want to know by how much standard of living has increased, that is over time. And across countries, we want to know how much higher the standard of living is in one country relative to the other. So the practical problem that we usually face is uh, how do we compute output per capita or output per person across countries? That is, since countries have different currencies and output in each country is uh, expressed in terms of their own currency, then how then do we capture and, and compare output? Per person across countries so as to compare the standard of living so the natural solution to this would be to use the exchange rate 
that is we compute for in for example uh, the south african gdp per person in rands and use the exchange rate to get south african gdp per person in dollars then compare it to the us gdp per person in dollars so in that way we can then see which country has the highest standard of living relative relative to the other between south africa and the usa however this uh, approach would not hold so because of this we then have to get a better solution which is basically using the purchasing power parity so let's look at these uh, let's look at these two uh, different approaches in more in more detail and why does the, the why wants the the first solution wouldn't hold that is the solution of using the exchange rate so why is the market exchange rate inappropriate so the exchange rate is um, the exchange rate approach is not appropriate for uh, two reasons so one exchange rate can vary a lot so for instance a 50 percent increase followed by a 50 percent decrease in exchange rate would mean that the standard of living of that particular country has increased and then decreased by 50 percent during that period and that is uh that's not correct so two the price of food and basic services differ between countries we've seen that generally countries within or rather with low output per person have lower food and service prices and therefore this will affect the the comparison between between the two countries so between because exchange rate often changes sudden which then artificially changes the value of the variable quickly such as gdp a depreciation for instance in the us dollar the rand exchange rate and rand exchange rate by say 10 percent will change gdp measured in us dollars by 10 percent immediately such a change would have been due to the change in the exchange rate market and not fundamental changes in the economy so exchange rates are determined by demand and supply in the exchange rate market as well as other extra nearest issues such as market sentiment and perception of risk so so since now we cannot use the market exchange rate approach why then is the ppp or other purchasing power parity method a better option so the ppp method fixes the two effects we have just explained so to fix these two effects, we construct the number for GDP per person using a common set of prices for all countries. Such adjustments to real uh, GDP numbers are called uh, purchasing power parity or PPP numbers. So the PPP method is best to measure and compare uh, GDP per person and the standard of living. So the purchasing power uh, of currency indicates the quantity of the currency needed to purchase a given unit of a good or common basket of goods and services. So purchasing power is clearly influenced by the relative cost of living and inflation rate in, in different countries. So purchasing power parity seeks to equalize the purchasing power of two countries by taking into account this cost of living and inflation uh, differences. So an example would be that if we convert the GDP in South Africa to US dollars using market exchange rate, while not taking uh, into account the relative purchasing power, the validity of that comparison is compromised. So adjustment of rates that take into account local purchasing power differences and inflation makes international comparison uh, more valid. So the PPP method is better because 
it indicates the quantity of the currency needed to purchase a given unit of goods or a basket of goods. Two, it influence, or rather it is influenced by the relative cost of living and inflation rate in different countries. And it also seeks to equalize the purchasing power of two, of two currencies and uh, by effect to two countries. So let's look at a practical example of, of what we just explained. So here's an example or rather the data given for an example. So assume that we're comparing two countries when, which is South Africa and the, and the USA. When South African annual consumption per person is basically 60,000 rands. That means the South African person consumes 60,000 rand a year. So the, an average South African person would consume two goods, that is a car and a basket of uh, of food. So a car costs 300,000 rand, while a, basket, uh, a food basket costs uh, 20,000 rand. So in the USA, the annual consumption per person is uh, $20,000 per year. So in the USA, a car costs $10,000, while food basket costs $10,000 as well. So let's make this assumption to, to further uh, uh, emphasize our point. So South Africans use their cars for an average of 15 years before replacement, while Americans use their cars and once a year and replace it. So South Africans and Americans, cars and food baskets are identical. So the question now is, use this, how can you use this information to compare the consumption per person in South Africa and the USA. So let's try to use the two different approaches to answer this question. So comparing the consumption using market exchange rate between the South African rand and the US dollar. So given that an exchange rate of uh, between the US dollar is the deterrent to one, to one US dollar. So we have to convert the South African consumption into dollars using the market exchange rate. So the solution will be that we basically divide the 60 rand or rather 60,000 rand, which is the annual, uh, annual consumption in South Africa, per person in South Africa by the exchange rate between the two. So this, this is going to give us the uh, $2,000. So this means that a South African consumption uh, in, in, a South, in a South African's consumption is basically in, in American uh, dollars is basically two thousand dollars. So to compare this, we have to divide the South African consumption by that of the U.S. consumption person. So that would be the two thousand dollars divided by twenty dollars. So twenty thousand dollars. So this gives us uh, one over ten. So what does this one over 10 tells us? It tells us that South African consumption per person is only 10% of US consumption. So while South Africans are poorer than Americans, this uh, solution is a, is a bit far-fetched. So let's use the PPP method to, to try and answer the question and see what we get. So how we do this is that we use the South African uh, uh, consumption expenditure on car ownership per year compared to that of the Americans. So because in South Africa, one car is divided into uh, 15 years. So we divide one by the 15 years. So meaning that a South African consumes 0 0.07 units of a car a year. So we times that by that of the consumption of the American dollars, because an average uh, American consumes $10,000 to to a car so that basically gave us 700 dollars so consumption of food is one bundle of food equivalent to that of south africa so they'll be equivalent so it's one times ten thousand so the total consumption per person in south africa will be the 700 plus the ten thousand that is ten thousand seven hundred so if we divide the south african consumption by that of the us which is ten thousand seven hundred divided by twenty thousand what we get now is 0 0.53. So this basically tells us that a South African consumption is 58%, is, sorry, is 53.5% of a US consumption per person. Okay, because of time, let's uh, end this part of our chapter 10.
here and continue from here next time.